You're listening to The Not Too Late Show, the only show where a divorce lawyer tells you the hard truths. Please welcome Sarah Schnarr and divorce attorney James Sexton. Hello, it's James Sexton. How are you? It's been a minute. It has been a minute. How are you, Sarah? It's good to see you. It's very good to see you, too. Um, Last time we talked, gosh, you have been super busy. I know you've had a lot of cases. What can you tell us? What's going on in in the Uh, life of a divorce attorney? You know, people are not getting better at staying married. I can tell you that for sure. I, 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 I'm always amazed because it's like the economy's good, people get divorced. The economy's bad, people get divorced. I think I have the like only recession-proof job because when the economy's good, everybody's like running around, having affairs, spending money, you know, vacationing. Mm-hmm. And when people, you know, when the economy's bad, people are like, oh my God, we're like fighting over money all the time. Everything's falling apart. So it it really is like, there's never a slow season. There's never a busy season. It's like just always this steady heartbreak ocean just flowing along all the time. It's crazy. It's crazy. But yeah, no, it's been a crazy couple months. AI is not going to be able to take over your job. Do you think you're pretty solid? As I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to be afraid of anymore. You know, I, here's what I'll say. I'm, it's more likely that AI will take over my job than people will get good at staying in relationships. Like, so I think if I'm going to be afraid of something, I guess I'll be afraid of AI, but I, I, I don't think I have to be afraid of people because marriage is still like the lottery. You're probably not going to win, but if you win, what you win is really good. So it's probably worth buying a ticket anyway. Well, so why are people still getting married though if there's so much divorce, if this is so constant? I mean, if that's the one thing that's not changing, I, why I, are I, people still doing it? You know, peer pressure. I think that's a piece of it. I think that, that, that the explanation, you know, if I said to you, oh, I've been with this woman for seven years and we've had a talk and we decided we're never getting married, you'd be like, oh, what's going on there? You know, who's a commitment phobe? But if I said, yo, we've been together for a couple of years, we're going to get married. You'd be like, of course, that's that's what you do. You know, it's like assumed that people will get married, which is weird because like for something that fails 56% of the time, you know, you wouldn't think it would be the thing we assume people are going to do, but yet somehow it is. So, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where that comes from. Nice that you have consistent work that's not going anywhere anytime soon. It sounds um, like it. What are what are you like? You're so you're just sitting there making a ton of money and crushing people's dreams. What do you make an hour? You know, I don't, I don't like, I don't make it rain. I just sell the umbrella. Like I'm not walking around bars saying to people like, "Hey, you could do better." You know, I, it's not like I kill them. You know, it's, I, I don't, I don't cause divorce any more than an oncologist causes cancer. Like if you can't, it's like my book. You know, if, if you're in my office, it's already too late. Like if you're here. It's because you're aware yeah. yet. There it is. Yes, yes. If you're yeah. the truth, like I don't, I don't go out and solicit happily married people and say, you know, maybe you should rethink this. People find me, they come to me, and by the time they're sitting in the chair across from me, you know, things are pretty bad. Things are on life support, if if not already dead, and I'm just there to help them bury it. But you know, yeah, I mean that that is it's a steady flow of new cases, dealing with old cases. I mean, I you have a kid with somebody. You got 18 years worth of litigation you can have with that person, yeah. modifying child support, increasing, decreasing arguments over custody. I mean, normal teenagers in intact families, you know, war mom and dad against each other whenever they can to their own advantage. So can you imagine when it's two separate households and two parents who don't, you know, have a lot of respect or trust for each other, how easy it would be for a teenager to weaponize mom and dad against each other to their own benefit, which is really, you know, teenagers are supposed to be kind of narcissistic. So it, it makes sense. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that the battle continues to rage on. How many marriages have you ended since the last time we talked? I, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, final ending of a judgment of divorce, I would say probably 10, something like that. But, you know, I fired the first shot over the bow as to at least a few. I filed three new actions this week. So that's three that are on the way. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's all, it's a process. It's like you have the ones that are starting, the ones that are in the middle at trial, the ones that are ending. So I'm kind of always along the continuum. And you never, you avoided the question, how much an hour? Just give me like a ballpark. 750. I'm 750. No, it's, everybody knows I'm 750 an hour. Yeah, it's it's out there. It's published. 750, and listen, 750 an hour, I'll mow your lawn. It's fine. I, you know, clients will call me and they'll just, they'll complain about their spouse for 750 an hour to me. And I sit there and I say to them, listen, like, 
you could get a really good bottle of wine for half my hourly rate. Like you, you should really just call me with the specific legal issue because otherwise it's really right. a waste of money. I mean, I'll listen, I'll stay on the phone as long as you, I tell clients for seven fifty an hour, I'll mow your lawn. I don't care. So, and I'm not the most expensive. I'm like a mid, you know, like a mid range high end German luxury car. I'm not like the Bentley or the Ferrari. <laughs> there are some, some of my, my colleagues are, are well over a thousand dollars an hour and worth it. A lot of them are absolutely worth it. So. I am in the wrong business. $750 an hour to crush a dream. Listen, oh. I, I've done worse things for less money. I tell everybody that I, I was a waiter for a really long time. So I, I, if I'm not slinging six ninety nine prime rib and coming home at 2 AM smelling like grease. I'm very happy. I'm in the air conditioning in the summer. I'm in the warm office in the winter. I've done worse things for less money than, uh, than help people uh, clean up the mess of their broken hearts. So. Well, we are lucky to have you just for those tuning in. And for those who don't know, let's give you a proper introduction. This is, I'm Sarah Schnarr, and this is Mr. James Sexton. He is America's divorce lawyer. He talked about this great book, which is a really, it's a really good read, actually, just even about relationships, because you are an expert on relationships. If you're in my office, it's already too late, a divorce lawyer's guide to staying together. This is a wonderful read. We are lucky to have you, and you can bill LA Magazine for... Half you are you you are you are too kind, Sarah. Thank you. That is very nice. I appreciate it. Yeah, writing the book was fun. It was a, it was a fun thing to do. I think I think you uh, you learn a lot about how to keep things together by watching them fall apart. So hopefully uh, hopefully it, it was helpful to some people and continues to be. Yeah, it was helpful to me too. I actually really appreciated some of the messages in there. James, let's get to the first question. Let's do it. Um, this one comes from Shirley from Lake Forest. Dear James, I've been married for fourteen years and we have two kids a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. My husband and I have been fighting for years now and have a pretty strong feeling that he's been cheating on me with a woman from work. I don't have physical proof, but I just know. I've asked him about it and he denies it, but I just know. If I were to leave him, does that mean that I'm not entitled to alimony? Should I try and get physical proof of his infidelities like pictures or texts and emails? Will that help me in court? And lastly, if I were to leave and meet someone else, Let's say we started dating. Would that affect my alimony? P.S. I'm not dating now, nor have I done anything shady in my marriage. I'm just asking in case we split up. Thank you, Shirley. Wow. All right. There. Shirley's got yes. a lot to unpack there. All right. So, <laughs> so let's try to take those. Let's try to unpack all of it. So one, here's the good news or the bad news, depending on who you are. There is no bad spouse penalty and there is no good spouse bonus. You know, you're dividing your assets 50-50, your child support and spousal support or what used to be called alimony rights. Those are all just tied to the length of the marriage and what each of you earns and, and other factors that are enumerated in the law. So you don't get, if you were a wonderful, dutiful spouse who was amazing and, and your spouse, you know, was not, you don't get a bonus, you don't get anything extra. And if your spouse was a terrible, lying, horrible cheat, you, they don't get penalized financially for that. Now, if they were wastefully dissipating marital assets, meaning if they spent a lot of money on a paramour, which is a nice name for the boyfriend or girlfriend, the secret boyfriend or girlfriend, um, you can argue that there's a wasteful dissipation claim and you should get some of that money back because the bracelet that they bought their boyfriend or girlfriend, that you know, you should be entitled to half of the value of that. But there really isn't a, a, a bonus or a penalty for those things. Um, what I will tell you in my experience as a divorce lawyer, an infidelity is a clay that I work in all the time. I represent the cheater. I represent the cheated on. Um, I, if you think your spouse is cheating, they probably are. It, I, 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 it, now, again, as a lawyer, it doesn't matter what I know. It matters what I can prove. But uh, wow. people come in all the time and they say, you know, I think my spouse might be cheating. The answer is they are. And, and, they, and even more shocking to me is not that. What's shocking to me is how many people come in and they go, you know, my spouse lost 40 pounds and they went out and bought all new boxer shorts and they've grown a goatee and now they also go out all that they're working a lot more than they used to. And also I, they're always very secretive with their phone, but someone said they might be cheating, but I don't know. I don't think they are. And I'm like, are you kidding me that you don't know if they are? They clearly are, you know? So, or well, no, he's this friend at work who he keeps hanging out with and she's 10 years younger than him and she's a yoga instructor and, you know, they, they, they but I don't know. I think they're just friends. Okay. Well, the, like, unless you have a head injury, like, yeah, no, this is not just his friend. That's insane. Um, so, so I, I, you know, if you feel that way, trust your gut. Assume that that's what's going on. But again, proof of it, 
maybe for yourself, it'll make you feel better to solidify in your mind that this is what's going on. Um, but legally, it's not something a court's going to be terribly interested in. It's not something that's going to be very important. People can be terrible spouses and be really good parents or really awful parents and really good spouses. So the fact that someone's a bad spouse and they cheat on you and things like that doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad mother or a bad father. So so it's not going to impact things like custody. And again, financially, there's not going to be any repercussions. So the question it sounds like you're asking underneath all of that is, we got a 10-year-old, we got a 12-year-old, we've been fighting for years, he might be cheating, we're not happy with each other. Okay, Listen, your marriage isn't a happy marriage, it sounds like. So is right. marriage something that you're like, all right, we're going to just be miserable and try to stick through this thing? You know, all the behavioral mental health research about children and divorce essentially says what we suspected, which is it's not divorce that screws kids up. It's parental conflict that screws kids up. And parental conflict happens to often correlate with divorce because people who fight a lot often tend to get divorced, but they don't have to. It's the conflict that's bad for the kids. So if two people split up, live in separate homes, co-parent well, de-escalate the conflict between them because now they don't have to be husband and wife to each other. They don't have to be spouses to each other. They can just be co-parents. You know, that is sometimes way better than trying to gut it out and stay married with a person who you're just not compatible with for the benefit of your children. Just to back up, because I know you kind of like, when when someone like Shirley has that question and she's already discussing alimony with you and she says mm-hmm. she's been fighting for years and years, at that point, are they in your office? Is it is their relationship so far gone that you don't need to play therapist? You j- then just sort of you know. Well, I don't play therapist to begin yeah. with. That's not what they're paying me yeah. for. You can you can get a right. good therapist for less than seven fifty an hour. What I often do is if someone comes in and there's an ambiguity about what they want, you know, people come in sometimes and they say to me, look, I got served with divorce papers. And then, okay, you're you're getting divorced then, buddy. You you may not want to be in a fight. You're in a fight now. Like somebody throws a punch at you. You don't have to want to be in a fight. You're in a fight. But, you know, in terms of, of people come in and they say, I'm having problems with my marriage. We're fighting a lot. I think my spouse might be cheating. My first step is not going to be, all right, let's file a divorce action. My first step is going to be, have you guys gone to counseling? Have you talked to each other about what's happening in your marriage? And I have a whole list of therapists, individual therapists, couples therapists that I'll refer people to. But the truth is, most of the time, they're delaying the inevitable in my experience. They come in and they're at that level. Because again, think about it, Sarah. This is not people who they're having problems in their marriage Mm -hmm. and they're talking to their friend about it. This is people who the problems in their marriage are so bad that they've come to a divorce lawyer. Like they've reached that level, you know? So, so that's what I mean when I say, I'm not saying if you're having some problems in your marriage, it's already too late. I'm saying if you're having some problems in your marriage to the point where you're sitting in a divorce lawyer's office, having a consultation, Mm -hmm. it's probably already too late. Got it. What's the average amount of alimony that's paid in the U S it would be a useless figure to give to you because it has to do with like, there's so many variables. Cause you have somebody like, you know, uh, P Diddy who's paying $20,000 a month. And then you have, you know, how many police officers or teachers that are paying $1,200 a month or tw- it has to do with what people are earning. So in terms of averages, it, it wouldn't give much instruction. What I always tell people is a rough, rough rule of thumb about one third, the duration of your marriage about 30% of your income. That's a good rule of thumb. So if you've been married for, you know, nine years, probably about three years worth of spousal support. And if you make $100,000 a year, probably in the range of $30,000 a year worth of spousal support. But again, those are very rough numbers and they vary much state by state. You know, California, New York, New Jersey, everybody does it a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And what's the rule of thumb for the duration that alimony would be paid? Yeah, so it's like a third of the duration of the marriage generally. So if you're married 30 years, it's going to be 10 years. If you're married 20 years, it's going to be, you know, seven years roughly. It's usually about a third of the duration. It could be a little more, a little bit less depending on the circumstances. You know, if, if, for example, you've been a stay-at-home parent and your spouse is a surgeon, it might be longer because the Mm -hmm. amount of time, the idea of spousal support now is to be what's called rehabilitative, which is it's, it's not to just say okay, well, you got married, so now you're entitled to the marital lifestyle for the rest of your life. That concept of alimony went away a long time ago. 
What's really the idea now is what's called rehabilitative. It's why most states now call it spousal support or maintenance. They don't use the word alimony. It's just like we don't say black necessarily. We say African-American. Why? Because it's a change in verbiage to change the sign. It's to change the focus to say, you know, look, spousal support is about supporting someone until they reach a point where they can rehabilitate themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is about a shift in thought and we accompanied it by a shift in words. So the idea is to essentially get somebody back on their feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's a good question. Absolutely. Hopefully it helps Shirley. We'll see. Uh, this one is from JT from Oakland. Hi, James. I've been dating my girlfriend for three years and she's made it clear that I need to either put a ring on it or get to step in. I actually do want to propose and know that she would be a great wife. Her grandmother is teaching her how to cook all of her recipes and she's actually closer with my mom than I am. Here are the issues. I have a really good job and have made far more money than she has. I'm afraid, I'm not afraid to ask her to sign a prenup, but do I ask after I propose or do most people do it before? The bigger question is, do prenups work? My guy friends say that prenups actually don't work and someone can always demand more. Is that true? Thank you, JT. JT, do not listen to your guy friends. Prenups do in fact work. Prenups are enforceable um, and prenups are an excellent idea. If more people had prenups, I would not be making 750 an hour. Um, prenups would put divorce lawyers out of business if people use them regularly. So prenups are important. Prenups are enforceable. Prenups are binding. Now, should you do the prenup by going, you know, going online, doing a Google search for a prenuptial agreement in the state you're in, printing it out, saving yourself a couple of thousand dollars? No, don't do that. If you don't do a prenup correctly, you might as well not have a prenup at all. But but the there is no divorce lawyer making lots of money on prenups. It is it is not a profitable item for a divorce lawyer to do. I probably do five or six prenups a month. And it is one of the least profitable things I do because the most expensive prenup I think I've ever done probably cost three, four thousand dollars. It's not a complicated wow. thing to do. So prenups are enforceable and prenups are a good idea. Now, when do you talk to her about it? That's a great question. Mm-hmm. And it's the first yeah. time I've ever had somebody ask it. So JT's already thinking ahead. It's, it's not surprising he's successful and he wants to protect that success financially. By the way, it also sounds like from his description, close with his mom, good cook, all these things. Sounds wonderful. You got lots of great ingredients here. You got a guy who's a hard worker and an earner. He's pragmatic in the way that he looks at marriage. He's thinking about financial things in the future. He recognizes positives and negatives in the relationship. He's thinking about what's a good time to talk about something, which again, that's great. That has to do with his communication skills. So we're, we're in a good spot here, buddy, but it does not mean you don't need a prenup. It's an excellent idea to have one. So when's the time to bring it up? Personally, I think, and Sarah, you, you as a woman may have a different perspective, but I'd love to hear it. I think you bring it up before you propose. I think you bring it up in advance. There's lots of ways to talk about prenups. You can just talk about whatever celebrities in the news who's getting divorced and say, oh boy, I wonder if they have a prenup. You know, how do you feel about prenups? Or, you know, I think prenups are a good idea. You know, put, put, put it out there as a general topic before making it specific. Because otherwise it feels to me, when you say to somebody, I want to marry you, which is what proposing is. Proposing is saying, I would like to marry you. You are proposing, at the risk of seeming unromantic, I would like to sign a legally binding contract with you that is governed by the laws of the state in which we reside. I'd like the government to get involved in our relationship. That's not a very romantic way of putting it, but that is what you're saying. So before you propose that, it's probably a good idea to have a conversation with the person about what that means to them. Mm-hmm. What about it you accept? What about it you don't accept? You know, and what what the two of you view it as. So I think in advance, before you propose is a great idea. Um, and having that conversation, I think, early is a very good idea. And then using it as an invitation to talk about the relationship. What do you expect from me? What do I expect from you? What are our roles potentially in this relationship? What happens when those roles change and if they do change, you know? Um, and, and that's a really important conversation to have. And I think that that's a good conversation for people who are thinking about getting married to be able to see if they can do, to have tough conversations mm-hmm. about difficult things that they might disagree on. If you can't do that, you got no business getting married to begin with. Right. So I would encourage that. But I, Sarah, I'd be interested to hear what you think. Do you think in advance or after the proposal? I think before, and I'm hoping that, you know, going into a relationship, you've got that kind of communication. I mean, 
setting that example to be able to talk about the difficult things. I think with prenups, it gets such a bad rap because it's there's such a negative connotation based around it. And I'd love to be able to change the narrative because a lot of people think, oh, he wants a prenup or she wants a prenup. It's usually he or whoever's bringing kind of more right. to right. financially the table. And I think, you know, from friends of mine, initially they're kind of like, well, how is he already questioning the trust and already bringing in this negativity into the relationship if he's already talking about a prenup? And, you know, I, I actually think the opposite. I think it can kind of be, if you look at it in an empowering way, you're saying, I want to be with you. How can we be fair and sort of set, you know, set, set something that's going to work for both of us. So we just sort of stay on track and kind of just, I don't know. I love I, that. I, I no, I love that. And I think you're on a great point because look, let's be honest, all marriages end. They all end. They either end in death or divorce. Like marriage is the only thing that you go, man, I hope this ends in death. You know, like it's, it's the old, like you want marriage to end in death till death do us part, but, but they right. all end in death or divorce. So, so having a conversation, like, you know, people don't want to die, but they have wills, they have life insurance. Right. Why? Because right. they're being pragmatic. They're being thoughtful. And yeah. more than anything, they're saying, I don't think the state should decide this for me. You have a will because you don't right. want the state to decide where your property goes. Well, why right. would you want the state legislature to decide how your property is divided, how uh, your your alimony would work? Why wouldn't you want to have that conversation together and say, hey, what do you think you're going to need? Is that fair? Is that unfair? You know, what plans do you want to make in terms of your career? What should we be investing in and not investing in? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I think having that conversation sooner rather than later is important. And by the way, I, I will say, Sarah, because you said, you know, male, female piece here. I have a lot of women coming in these days who get prenuptial agreements, not only some that are executives and very successful financially, and they're marrying a guy who's an artist or a musician or an inventor, creator, something that, that maybe isn't as lucrative. Um, and they're more in the, in the executive space. And I also do a lot of prenups for people that they have a lot of family money or family real estate, you know, their mom or dad bought them a condo, bought them a home. And they're saying, listen, I like my soon to be son-in-law. I like my soon to be daughter-in-law, but I didn't buy them a house. If we split up, if you guys split up, I want you to keep that thing. Cause that's why I gave it to you. So there's lots of reasons why people have prenups, but JT, it sounds like um, you're already in the right headspace. It sounds like you got a, a, a good partner there. And hopefully you guys can have that kind of a conversation. Cause I think there's, there's a lot to be said and there's a lot to learn about each other from that conversation. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You explained that really well. I liked, I, I, it's, it would be nice to change that the narrative because I mean, it's, it's, it's more about value. I think if, if you right. can kind of discuss it in, in that light. Right. And, 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 and those kinds of honest conversations are really, I think what a good marriage is built on. It's built on being able to have tough conversations along the way rather than waiting until stuff is just completely screwed up and then going, all right, how do we fix this now? Like, I think right. you got to have little uncomfortable conversations all along the way. So things never get that bad. Mm -hmm. Well said. Third question. Now this one is from Ronnie from Scottsdale. James, my wife spends a ton of time on social media. She's on TikTok, Instagram. I haven't even heard of half of the sites she's on. What's worse, I think it's having an increasingly negative impact on our relationship and her view of me. Is this something you're seeing more of among the people who end up in your office? And how can I bring this up without upsetting or offending her? I honestly think it's becoming an addiction. Please help Ronnie. Oh, media. oh, Ronnie and Scottsdale, I have to tell you, you are you are not alone, my friend. Um, yeah, look, social media is creating a toxic environment for people. There's no question about it. Um, and why is that? Look, I'm not a psychologist, but, you know, you don't need to be a weatherman and know which way the wind blows. You're 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 watching people's greatest hits while you live your gag reel. Come on. Right. Like your 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 wife is looking at pictures of everyone's best moments from their vacations, everyone's best dressed look, you know, their spouse at their best, everyone at their best. And when's she doing it? Are any of us on our stupid phones looking at social media when we're having a wonderful time? No, it's when we're like sitting around, we're bored, we're, we're sitting in traffic, we're sitting in the waiting room, we're sitting on the toilet, and we're looking at everybody. So we're just living our, our boring moment and looking at the coolest, best looking, best moments of everybody. So of course, right. there's a broader issue here in society where everyone is comparing themselves to filtered, 
false versions. So let me be the one to tell you, Ronnie, if no one has before, that person who's posting on Instagram that your wife is looking at their marriage and going, oh, you know, look, greatest husband ever, hashtag blessed. Um, that guy was probably in my office last week having a consult. Like, I can't tell you how many people I, I look at their social media, most of which is public. I can't imagine why that is, but people do it all the damn time. And by the way, anything you put on social media can and will be used against you in a court of law. I promise, because I'm going to use it. Divorce lawyers love the stuff you put on social media. Every picture of you drinking, every picture of you being irresponsible, I'm going to screenshot that and I'm going to put it into evidence when there's a custody trial. So watch out because nothing you put on the internet ever goes away. But beyond that, listen, people are showing you the best version of what they wish their marriage was like. And if your wife is comparing your marriage to that marriage, you're going to lose, buddy. You're going to lose. Just like I do not... I might look like a person you meet in real life. I am not going to be able to compete with an airbrushed version of one of the Hemsworths. It's not going to work, okay? So so the truth is, like, you got to just bring it back to earth as best you can. You have to be clear with her about the expectations. Look, if, if, if you compare your wife to an imaginary perfect wife, she's never going to stand up to that. And if you say to her, listen, if you compare me to an imaginary husband – then yeah, I'm always going to fall short of the mark. But but don't compare me to imaginary things. Ima- compare me to real people. Compare me to real people that you know and know well. Not even just all well, my friend's husbands. You don't know your friend's husbands. You know what your friends tell you about their husbands, but you don't know what they're really like behind closed doors. And the internet and social media has just amplified that like you wouldn't believe. So, you know, look, I don't have a solution to the massive social problem of what social media is doing to our perception of ourself in comparison to others, what it's doing to our greater society. There's a chapter in my book called, if there was an infidelity generating machine, we would call it Facebook. And now I will probably amend that title to say, or Instagram or TikTok, because it's got all of us back in touch with our high school girlfriend or boyfriend we have no business talking to, remembering a time when life was simpler and we didn't have so many bills and it was lots of fun to just roll around in bed with this person, right? Because you were 19 or you were 17. You can't, your current spouse can't compare to that, you know? So, So don't, you know, again, comparison is the thief of joy. It always has been. It always will be. We just now have way more to compare ourselves to. So, Ronnie, I would encourage you to, to if possible, it sounds like you're not big on social media. Modeling that behavior is a good idea um, for, for other people. You know, I think some of us have to be willing to put this stuff down. But also just pointing out to her where reality and unreality match up on social media. I think that's important, too. And it may be something that, that you know, you need to – you need to work on, she needs to work on with a professional. I, I think there are a lot of people struggling right now because they're comparing themselves to false idols that are out there. And I, I think that's really bad for all of us. It sounds like she's struggling and it's creating struggles in your marriage. So the struggle that she's having might be with herself and maybe an act of love is saying to her, hey, you're spending a lot of time on this social media. It, what's going on with you individually? Mm-hmm. Well, and it's also, it's such a slippery slope too, because if, if it, it creates a further disconnect where you're getting oh. your needs met through something, through some, someone else, it, I always, I'm curious, like, is there a conversation that you have with your partner as to you cannot speak to your exes or like you're, you're gonna the danger, it's, it's your yeah, the danger of that is that that comes off it's controlling it's my insecurity it's things like that but it's but see, it's not about just talking to your exes it's about being engaged in the present you know you and i are having a conversation right now sarah and if you started speaking and you're telling me your perspective and all of a sudden i start you know I mean, how many times you've been in a conversation with someone and all of a sudden they're doing this while you're talking? And my, I make people wildly self-conscious when they do that to me. As soon as someone starts looking at their phone, I go, oh, I'll wait. And I just sit there and sort of stare at them, you know, and just wait and just wait. You done? Okay. You know, and it makes me, because otherwise people will just sit there like this while, yeah, no, no, yeah, that's crazy. Uh-huh. No, I can't believe it. That's nuts, you know? And you can't, like, we're, we're just not there. I guess what, being in a relationship, you're supposed to be there. If you're not there, why are we in a relationship? Like, I could be alone alone. I don't need to be alone with you. If, if you're going to rob me of my solitude, you owe me companionship. 
That's how it works. So if people are getting married, they're getting married because they've decided they like companionship. So being alone together, probably more lonely than being alone alone, you know? Right. Um, we're going to wrap this up, but it just it reminds me, I've just had a wedding um, not too long ago, and um, they were both actors and beautiful wedding. But then maybe a week later, there was already trouble in paradise over social media. She wanted to post the wedding video and she wanted to put all these pictures. He said, no, this is a private ceremony for us. And she said, yeah, but I have fans. I have, you know, my audience wants to see. And he said, that is our special moment. We got married. They shouldn't be invited into our lives in that way. And I was like a week in and we're already having, you know, these issues with social media and you know, they're going to have to find a, a nice balance as to what can she post? Can she post? And what is he going to, because if she's posting something and she's saying, welcome into my life, he yeah. doesn't really have a choice. It's kind of also welcome into his life as well. And so it's such I a challenge. And I, I, I think the idea of, of how we present ourselves, it's so important. It's so difficult mm -hmm. because you're, you're absolutely right. You know, look, there's, there's the public performance of who we are, especially people in the entertainment industry. You know, it's like I, I, I was talking to someone the other day and I, you know, a colleague of mine and they said something. And I said, you know, you've never met Jim Sexton. You've met James J. Sexton Esquire. You spent a lot of time with James J. Sexton Esquire. Jim Sexton is a different guy. Jim Sexton's the guy who's with his kids. Jim Sexton's the guy who's with his friends. Jim Sexton, that's a different person. James J. Sexton Esquire is who I am professionally. You know, so, so the question is, is who got married? Whose wedding was that? Was that the two celebrities or is this right. two people? And, and what do we keep for ourselves privately and what do we share with the world? And that's a personal choice. There are people that say your partner's body, you should be the only person that gets to see it. There are people that say, hey, if your partner is a model or your person, you know, your partner is someone who, who is sexualized in their profession, you know, they they have an OnlyFans, they have, I get this all the time where people come in and they say, listen, I had an OnlyFans when we met, you know, we've been dating. Now he's saying, nope, you got to get rid of that. And it's a huge stream of revenue for me. What do I do? And my attitude is, listen, you have to have a difficult conversation with each other about what is ours privately, what is ours publicly, and you got to reconcile that. But again, why wouldn't you have that conversation before the wedding? The fact that people are having that conversation after they've already gotten married strikes me as insane because that would have been something to talk about a couple of days ago, not mm -hmm. after you've already signed the contract. Right. James, thank you. I love having you. You've always such such excellent insight. Great to see you, Sarah. As always, I got to get back to doing the impossible for the ungrateful. But it's always Crushing nice to spend dreams. some time. It's always nice Crushing to spend some time dreams. with you. You too. You too. Go make some money. Go crush some dreams. Good love to see you. you. You too. Take care. If you have any relationship or divorce questions and want to hear from attorney James Sexton, be sure to email podcasts at lamag.com.